Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Nancy Lindborg. I'm the president of the U.S. Institute of Peace. And the U.S. Institute of Peace was founded by Congress a little more than 30 years ago, dedicated to the proposition of a world without violent conflict. And that peace is very possible, it's very practical, and it's essential for global security. So this is the right place to have the conversation that we're about to have today. And I welcome everybody. I'm delighted that we're able to host this conversation. And most of all, I really commend the World Bank and the UN uh, for a truly landmark joint effort. Um, they have produced uh, a much needed report on how to get ahead of violent conflict, how to break out of these vicious cycles of protracted conflict, and how to think about doing business differently. And importantly, they've pulled some of the core precepts of peace building into the development world, an emphasis on addressing grievances, an emphasis on inclusion, an understanding of the importance, particularly in uh, uh, countries where governments are not paying attention, of nonviolent civic action, of the power of communities to make a difference. Um, it is clear that the international community is less successful currently at preventing conflict, uh, and we rely over and over again on reaction, on deploying troops, peacekeeping troops, large humanitarian efforts, and it is very clear that we have to change that. And if we don't, the consequences of failing to act and to prevent Violent conflict includes more deaths, more displacement, uh, more incidents of violent extremism. So some of you may have been with us in the fall when we previewed this report. And I can say that the preview of that report has already provoked um, a lot of good conversation. And we look forward to continuing that conversation. I'm looking out. I see a lot of people who have been engage, engaged in this issue, uh, not just from this fall, but for in some instance, several decades. So this is an important moment in a changed environment for us to collectively look at the business case, the evidence case that this report makes. Um, I look forward to today's discussion. And I invite you to engage on the conversation on Twitter with hashtag pathways numeral four peace, hashtag pathways for peace. And now I'd like to welcome two of the lead report authors to present the main themes and findings of the report and really help frame and set the stage for the conversation. Um, Alexander Mark is the Chief Specialist for Fragility, Conflict, and Violence uh, of the World Bank. And he oversees support and advi advice to bank country teams in more than 30 countries uh, affected by conflict and fragility. Um, and I also want to welcome Diego Salman, uh, who is uh, Jago Salman, who is the advisor uh, to the UN World Bank Partnership on Fragile and Conflict Affected Situations at the United Nations. And Jago has more than 15 years of experience in doing this kind of work in really tough places around the world. So please welcome to both of them who will give us an overview of the report. Thank you, Jago and Alexander. Hi, and, and thanks to, to everybody for being here. I, I want to particularly acknowledge a, a number of contributors and authors to the report who are in the audience. So Seth, um, Chuck, Georgia, who I can see. I'm sure there's others here. I think Teresa Whitfield from DPA in New York is also in the audience, as well as a number of the contributors who supported the bank and the UN coming together um, to deliver the report. Norway, Sweden, the UK, France. Um, Germany contributed in kind, but this was really a collective effort. Um, I think there was a, a recognition that the bank and the UN coming together to say something, even if not or everything we say is new, the fact that we say it together um, matters significantly. The, the, let me just work. Okay, so how did we, how did we, we get here um, practically and also sort of conceptually? The, the, the practical side of this began in a conversation around 2016, um, essentially where the UN was going through the major reviews of peace and security, so the Sustaining Peace 
Review's advisory group of experts report on sustaining peace, the high-level panel on peace operations, women, peace and security, all of which pointed to a, a number of core challenges in the, the international peace and security architecture, but also highlighted and underlined the, the growing importance of prevention for the success of that, that architecture. Um, on the, the parallel side in, in the bank, in the development processes in the bank, was the, the IDA 18 replenishment round, which has significantly scaled up the support through development instruments to fragile states, moving to $15.1 billion over the next, or the next three years at this point, but four years at that point. And, and the convergence that you saw between these two um, major processes was on two sides. On one side, on the peace and security side, you had a very clear statement that there are very few problems that are of peace and security that are entrusted to the multilateral community to deal with today that are solely peace and security problems. Um, much of the instability that we see around the world is rooted in domestic instability. This is not just interstate competition. And on the parallel side, on the IDA 18, um, discussions was the point that development aid needs to prove its relevance not just in recovery from conflict but also preventing conflicts from, from breaking out. And this began a conversation between the bank in 2016 um, and the UN about trying to sort of push forward a policy agenda that brought us together collectively around shared ideas on what prevention would actually, would actually look like. Um, the, the original idea that we, was, was from the bank who invited the, very bravely the UN into the conversation. Those of you who know the WDR 2011 will know that it was a, a report written by the bank with heavy consultation from the UN, but it was not a, a co-owned report. And I think we've both, all of us, learned an enormous amount um, in this process. I personally learned that I don't want to clear a report through the Chief Economist's Office, the UN Legal Department, the Bank Legal Department, and the Secretary General's Office. Um, no, no, no. I, I, again, no. never. Um, <laughs> but there are many other things that we've learned as well, substantively. The, now, the, the pressure on this, on the the pressure that pushed us together, sorry, if I can get this to change. Um, this, this is also rooted in, in, in context. And I, I'll, I'll go through a series of slides quite quickly to present some of the main, the main ideas. Uh, we won't dwell on them. There's much more data in the main report, um, which is available on this. But this pressure that was coming from the policy processes was coming out um, of, a, of a dramatic shift um, that began around 2010, or the acceleration of it began in 2010. You can see the curve um, begin to change um, earlier in the 2000s. But what you saw was a very worrying change. Um, on the quant Every quantitative indicator that we have, essentially, on conflict began changing direction in 2010. Um, the number of, of conflicts, terrorist attacks, um, uh, numbers of forced displaced populations, civil, casu civilian casualties, battle deaths. Essentially, any quantitative indicator that we collect began to change direction at that point in, in time. Um, on, top of that, and that, on top of that, you saw a qualitative change um, in, in the nature of conflict or the direction of conflict. Um, you saw some of this was a continuation of trends that were already picked up earlier, five years earlier, six years earlier. Some of them were, were relatively new. In terms of the continuation of trends, you saw this continuing spread of conflicts becoming um, more protracted. Um, even when interrupted by a peace deal, the chances of relapse remain very, very high. So either very long protracted conflicts or rep repetitive series of, of violence that held the country back in any development pathway. Um, you also saw that the continuing cross-border dynamics of, of conflict, the regionalization that was picked up in 2011 in the WDR, um, was absolutely transparent, and of course, in the Middle East. And, but you also saw it in the Lake Chad Basin, you saw it um, with the spillovers from Somalia, and you saw increasing dynamics of conflict spilling over borders to affect neighboring countries, and much further away from the battlefield than that. Um, not beyond the other numbers, one of the other disturbing numbers here was the number of countries that were affected by violent conflict. It was the highest in 2016 was the highest in 30 years. So individual violent incidents that were taking place far from any battlefield. Qualitatively, you saw two shifts that I think were less expected. One was the, the proliferation of non-state armed, armed groups um, in these conflicts, both fighting each other and fighting, fighting states. Um, and you saw the, the internationalization, a, a dramatic return of internationalization of conflict, defined as, as foreign troops fighting in another country. Um, so this isn't just indirect support, this is deployment of active personnel um, into combat. 
Um, one, one caveat, the data behind this is what you also see behind all of this is an increasing complication of the legal definitions of conflict and the data on conflict, which are pulling to some degree in different directions with a growing complication and proliferation of different forms of non-state conflict, while the legal definitions and regulation is still quite based around rather sim simple categories. The other, the other caveat I've mentioned here is there isn't a correl not all of these variables correlate with each other. So for example, that the, the spike in non-state armed groups is not correlated with the spike in, in battle deaths, for example. The, the large rise of battle deaths is driven very much by use of state militaries against non-state armed groups in urban areas. Um, so you see that the proliferation of armed groups or the internationalization of conflict um, has made it much harder to resolve conflicts, not necessarily driven the increase in, in battle deaths. Um, the other trend that lay behind this, and this is where I think really the push on the, on the prevention agenda came for the international community, is this very disturbing graph that you see here. The, the, over, the, the di decline in the numbers of conflicts in the world that have been achieved since 1990 or 1994 um, was not one war that was defeated, was not one peace agreement. It was a system of engagement over at the international level, at the regional level, that over 30 years had progressively ended more conflicts per year than had started um, that year, which meant over time you incrementally were bringing down the level of, of conflict. What you saw in 2010 was both a dramatic increase um, in the numbers of conflict, the quantitative indicators, but you also see much more worryingly a drop in the ability of that system to sustainably terminate or end conflicts at that point in time. The reason why this graph is, is so disturbing is any conflict that we have, is the, if DRC continues in a direction of destabilization, um, if other countries joined it, it will continue to add to the, uh, the orange bar there um, without the chance of it necessarily being resolved. The, la the second point of that is the cost. The costs are, are fairly well known. I won't go into them, into them here. But what you see is that what was in many ways a crisis management architecture, peacekeeping, humanitarian aid, um, the refugee system is different, but th this, the costs of that crisis management um, just continuing to trend upwards. Um, with very few signs that we're going to be able to withdraw humanitarian assistance um, or peacekeepers from many of these, these conflicts. Behind the numbers, these are per annum costs. If you take the graph on how protracted conflicts are becoming, you're talking about these per annum costs um, on a recurrent expenditure uh, basis. This one. Aha, it's the wrong button. This is the... Um, the other key finding that came out of this after looking at the context is there's very few conflicts that we could see um, in the cases that we were looking at that were purely local um, anymore. Um, we heard this in every regional consultation um, that we undertook, uh, and we can go into the methodology a bit, but came again and again, actors were saying to us, you, know, you can't talk about these conflicts in isolation from what is going on at the global level or at the regional level. And when you step back from that, what you saw is in, in, in an increasingly independent world, these, these, these structural changes um, that were happening um, in, in, in the world that are having a direct impact on the conflicts themselves. I mean, the one that we talk a lot about at the moment, of course, is ICT. Um, some of these were taken as, as, risk, as opportunities, pure opportunities for, for development. And we're now seeing the underside or the dark side of some of these, these processes. Um, and they impact not just um, the Western world, where there's been a lot of focus, they have huge impacts uh, on, on the developing world, if we're going to use that word. Um, migration, we talk a lot about migration coming into the DAC countries. A lot of the migration has been internal, um, rapid urbanization, rapid moves away from, from agricultural or subsistence farming. And with the increase of global risks and opportunities, again, causality gets very difficult. You see um, a growing lack of consensus at it politically around how conflict, what the treatment regime for conflicts might be. What is the correct response um, to the, the growing instability in various parts of the world? I say causality is complicated because you can't say one is directed to the other, but most clearly you see this um, in Security Council um, decision making, essentially, the, the, the difficulties of agreeing what a standard treatment regime would be. Now behind that, the one thing that you get is a clear commitment to the Sustainable Development Goals, which is the most comprehensive set of universally agreed goals that we've ever had for agreeing on people, planet, peace, prosperity, and partnership as the basis for the next wave of, of future development, a wave of development that cannot afford to leave people behind. And when you take the, what the study pulls together is you take the numbers on the response side and you look at the trend lines um, of what crisis management costs, 
And then you look at the costs that are being incurred in a rapidly developing world where many of the conflicts are now occurring in middle-income countries. Quite simply, the cost-benefit analysis of prevention versus response has shifted dramatically. Where once upon a time it may have been um, cost-effective to simply contain a conflict and manage its fallout, um, that cost-benefit calculation has begun to, to change dramatically in the, the other direction. And what you see is in a, in a very, in a scenario analysis, and if you had a preventative system that was able to respond to conflicts and um, contain conflicts, but was only successful three out of four, um, one out of four times, and cost over a billion dollars per intervention, the savings would still be at the level of around $5 billion per year. Um, the, and if you have a much more optimistic scenario, you would be looking at a, uh, uh, a saving around $70 billion a year. And the numbers aren't arbitrary there. A billion dollars over is roughly the cost of an annual, the annual cost of deployment of a multidimensional peacekeeping mission. So if you were to deploy a peacekeeping mission to every conflict that you saw emerging, um, and it was only successful one out of four times, you would still be making enormous savings at the international level. So I'll, just to wrap up, to say sort of where this, this took us, what we, what we saw ourselves on the, the final analysis of the, the present, of the material was looking at the, the cases of countries. We took 15 cases of countries that had sustainably exited pathways of instability. Um, and all of those cases, what we saw is very rarely certain key messages jumped out at us. Um, one is, is, although there's been enormous focus on institutions over the last, over the last six, seven, eight, nine years, what we saw is many of those countries, it wasn't just reform of institutions by a long way that enabled them to sustainably exit from, from conflict. What you saw was a, a large amount of focus also on the socioeconomic drivers um, of, of violence. You saw them reinvesting in, in communities or in geographic areas that had been the source of, of, of conflict. You saw them opening up more participatory pathways into, into politics. Um, the, the second thing that, that jumped out at us uh, a lot in this was, was sequencing, and Alex will come to this, is, is states engage economically, they engage through security, they engage politically throughout a conflict cycle. They, it, this is not sequenced the way that the international community sequences its interventions. Um, you saw that in some cases there were very prolonged engagements, 30, 40, 50 years engagements, investing in areas um, adjusting institutions, opening up, reforming um, some of the, uh, the, the uh, governance systems, um, infrastructure, so on, before peace was sustainably reached. Um, and that the, the, the sustainable dividends on prevention came from a less sequenced way. And the third, the third thing that we, we saw, which is particularly pertinent when we look at the data on conflict and how much of it is non-state today, is the state was really one of many actors in this, in this process. The state was an important actor, an essential actor, um, but it was really coalitions um, that drove forward the, the, the agenda on prevention. It was never a single leader that had the capacity or the power to adjust these three big variables in society and lead it to a more sustainable piece. Um, not all of these messages, I think, are, are, are new. I think they're reminders of things that we knew um, actually before. Um, but they matter a lot in how we engage in this business case at this point in time and how we revisit some of the lessons that we had already, perhaps, but that we now need to look at in terms of our operations. And I'll hand over to, to Alex on the... Thank you very much. So, you know, we, 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 we use this, this old approach that we are two institutions working and we're always next to each other so that we check on each other when we present, right? So, so um, this, I'm going now to talk a little bit about what do we do with all those findings that we have there. And as Jago said, one of the most interesting part of the study for us was that we worked on those 15 case studies of countries that have success, successfully moved out of fragility plus had a lot of number of analysis and case study of what worked. So if this report is a bit different, a lot of those reports in this area are usually about what does not work. We try to focus really on what worked. And, uh, and so the, the, we, we came out with, with three principles that you are not, not going to be astonished about, but I think they're really, really important. The first, prevention needs to be targeted. That means it's not by doing more development that you do prevention is not about doing more poverty alleviation. You really need to target the sources of grievances, the sources of conflict. It's not just doing more of something. It's about really targeting what are the issues in different specific contexts. With the targeting comes also this issue of comprehensiveness. 
is not by doing each thing individually that we usually do in those cases, is by really doing them in a coordinated and comprehensive fashion. The second thing is the inclusive aspect, and this has really two very separate things. One is that inclusion in terms of the way we approach the development uh, policies of country and the way successful governments have uh, approached it is really about inclusiveness. Trying to understand what are the different groups in society and how you bring them in. And it's not always the poor that do conflicts, it's actually rarely the poor that go into conflict. So inclusiveness is more than poverty reduction. It's about bringing those different groups that are in society inside. The second where, place where inclusiveness is needed is really between the different actors that works, work on peace building. They need to come together. And as Jago said, coalitions are really central in this, in this uh, field. Finally, it's sustain. And uh, uh, we know that this has to be sustained, and we know that that's the big problem, right? One of the big problems is we're not managing to sustain our attention to conflict. Sustain means three things. It means four things, actually, and that's the difference maybe with the, with the usual uh, approach to it. It's much earlier than the crisis. It's when we see the first appearance of risks. Secondly is when crises loom. Thirdly, there's prevention also during crisis to avoid escalation. And finally, is long, long, long after the crisis stops. And I think that's the difference of this report. It brings this first part that is very early on that you don't see in many other literature on prevention. Now, uh, in terms of the actions to do, we see uh, in this report that grievances are very central. That does not mean that you don't have war economies, that you don't have uh, leaders that uh, manipulate uh, for their own interest uh, uh, people's uh, motivation for violence. But one thing that is sure with grievance is that we have, it was difficult to find only one conflict that, didn't, that didn't start with an element of grievances, uh, especially around exclusion. So uh, focalizing on grievance is very important. We've seen that the geographical aspect is really, really important. So a lot of grievances around what we call horizontal inequality, uh, discrepancy between regions, between group, that's very important. But also uh, the geographical tells us that marginalized area, border areas, areas where state legitimacy is not projected are also a real area of risks. So the, this focus on marginalized area is really, really important. The second thing is we thought that there were a number of areas where we needed to target risk. These were the areas where the risks were the highest, but also the opportunities were the highest. And these were power. Power takes many different forms. Power is not only election. Power is how people control their own resources. Power is citizen engagement is about power. The centralization is about power. We just don't have to see power as a purely issue of uh, political control of the state. Uh, natural resources are still very, very important in most of the conflict we have reviewed. And then security and justice, that's a message directly from the WDR 2011. Finally, uh, the, 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 the reinforced participation, that's really the answer to, to power. And participation has to talk, you know, there's, no, there's not a silo of political and a silo of development. People live that in the same way. You know, I have access to resource, I don't have access to power, I have access to power and resources. All this is, is one, it's not things you can separate. And therefore participation is a very important aspect. Finally, the exclusion of service is really important. That's something that was not so much talked in the WDR 2011. It's not, we, we didn't see a direct correlation between lack of exclusion of services and conflict, but you, where you see the correlation is because without uh, a legitimate service delivery, you don't build up, build up the legitimacy of the state, and then the state is not able to actually be a legitimate actor on conflict resolution. So that's the trick. Now, uh, there are uh, a number of really important parts. We looked quite a lot about issue of gender and issue of women. Uh, that's a focus we had, and it was very clear uh, that, first of all, Society where there's more equality between men and women are more resilient to conflict. We have all the evidence that are described there. But also that when you engage women group in peace process and all that, there's, there's a lot 
of, uh, of benefit and actually you're more successful on preventive activities. So I'm not going to go into detail. We have quite a lot in the report on that. Then on youth, of course, we all know youth. What we want to say very clearly is that youth is not only a problem of jobs. The, the youth really today is a problem of an unmet aspiration. And this problem of unmet aspiration is many things. Is a projection of what you want to be that you will never be able to be. Is to be able to do better than your parents, which you cannot do anymore. It's a lot of things that are much more complex than job. And therefore, that's a complex also things to uh, impact. Now, the shocks are very important as triggers. And that's something that is uh, important to say. Now, not that shocks automatically create conflict. Shocks can also create peace, as we know, like in Aceh. But the management of shock is not something we're doing sufficiently well with uh, an understanding of what it can do on conflict. And finally, the strengthening the ability to deal with all the global and regional risks that Jago has mentioned that are really fundamental in conflicts today. So uh, another uh, big discussion we had throughout the preparation of the, the report is the problem of the siloed approach versus a much more connected approach and in interwined approach between the different actors working on prevention mostly political, security, humanitarian, and development, right? What is really interesting is that uh, when we looked at the successful case, we saw that government were actually much more uh, working around this element. So countries that were doing successful prevention had much more dialogue between their military and their development. Uh, there were all sorts of platform for military to discuss with others, for humanitarian to be coordinated with the political. Uh, there was a lot of connectivities. We as, as international community are much less good at doing that, and therefore much less good at helping those countries that are doing the right thing. And uh, uh, we're still very siloed, where still we see development are not effective once you have a crisis. So we see development coming before crisis and much after crisis. And then we see the political uh, coming much too late uh, when crises are already there, while crisis takes a very long time to build. Uh, and then we see the issue of security also very narrowly uh, uh, dealt with. So one of the big recommendations, and we have some pretty specific uh, 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 ideas on that in the report, is about building all those bridges. Finally, just a few ideas because we have 40 pages of recommendation, but just to give you what you actually want to do, uh, and, and I'm just going to identify a few things here that I think are very important. Develop shared analysis for understanding of risks. Very, very evident. Everybody would say it's normal. Nobody does it. So, you know, we don't share our analysis with government. We don't share our analysis between ourselves. We all have our different systems, and we are very secretive about it. That's not how you do an open dialogue with a government around the risks. That's really not how you do it. Uh, 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 you need to establish project and planning framework. One real problem of prevention is the fragmentation of the activities. This is really what works, because each individual approach to prevention actually work. So there's good practice on mediation, there's good practice on certain development intervention, there's good, but they are fragmented. They are not brought together. And so we really need to move in, 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 inside such uh, a sort of planning process. And you know, uh, we have to learn from countries. Niger has a really interesting program, a planning that has security, that has humanitarian assistance included, that has uh, uh, a lot of the political negotiation included into this planning process. But when we ask our organization if we can do it, we say, oh, no, no, that's, that's not feasible. But countries do it, right? Some countries do it. Uh, and then uh, we really need, there's a huge issue of consolidation of financing. Again, this fragmentation is really terrible and, and really plays, again, the efficiency of the system. So just a few ideas here, and we go into the report in much more detail. So I hope we're going to have interesting conversation and that we've stimulated you a little bit. I want to invite our panelists to come up.
We have a terrific panel here today. Um, we'll have a conversation, then we're going to open it up. I know a lot of folks have comments and questions. Um, come on in. We have with us today uh, Her Excellency Dika Yassin, who is the Minister of Women and Human Rights Development in Somalia. Uh, Frank Bousquet, who's the Senior Director for Fragility, Conflict, and Violence at the World Bank. Um, Oscar Fernandez Taranka, the Assistant Secretary General for Peace Building Support at the United Nations. And Kate Sanvangziri. Kate, how'd I do on that? Perfect. Sanv <laughs> uh, who's the Acting Deputy Assistant Administrator for the Bureau of Democracy, Conflict, and Humanitarian Assistance at USAID. So we have here representatives of three of the largest institutions working on these issues um, in conflict-affected areas. So this is, the, you can feel the needle moving just by having the three of you up on stage. Um, but I want to start, uh, uh, Your Excellency, with you, because Somalia has been an area that a lot of people have put a lot of heartbreak into, most especially the Somali people, for several decades trying to move out of conflict. Um, and you've made incredible progress, over, heartening progress, over the last few years. So tell us, what, what do these concepts look like on the ground? And how have you and your government really tried to work in these issues of inclusivity? And what we heard is especially important are women and youth, which are directly in your portfolio. So what does that look like on the ground in, in Somalia? First of all, good morning to everybody. I'm glad to be here. And I, um, you know, in Somalia, um, despite the immense challenges that we face, um, Somalia has achieved significant progress in increasing inclusivity and addressing grievances uh, over the past year. Um, a good example is the political process processes that uh, happen in Somalia, as an example. Um, Somalia political leaders have shown how um, group grievances can be addressed uh, by adjusting um, how we, um, you know, the adjusting the institutional framework. Uh, we came up with the political power sharing model that uh, that has been established uh, to ensure that all clans uh, in Somalia are included in these um, uh, processes. And basically, this was um, a way to um, make uh, those processes included so that all um, clans that were not um, part of the decision making now are um, included. So one good example is the 2016 election. Um, I think uh, it's good that um, we also give um, examples on the ground so that uh, the theory then we can. Uh, so for example, in 2016 election, I had the opportunity to be the deputy uh, chair of the indirect electoral um, implementation team at the federal level. And we try to um, make that process as inclusive as possible compared to the 2016 election. Um, if I may, um, to, to show exactly how it worked, in 2012, uh, we had 135 clan elders that were um, selecting the 275 member of the parliament of the, uh, the House of the People. In 2016, we tried to uh, make that process as uh, inclusive as possible compared to the 2016, 2012. And what we have done was that uh, the, um, where at the beginning in 2012, the 135 um, in elders, they were alone selecting who they wanted, basically. Now we try to uh, make them uh, consult within the clan members. So the power was taken a little bit back and they resisted a lot. But then um, 
it, it was a, a good process and they underst understood. How, so, how did you get to that understanding? When you say I mean, they resisted, this is often resisted. where the process stops. Of course they resisted because in 2012 they were <coughs> alone deciding who uh, will be the MP of that specific clan. Now we said if this seat is uh, shared, let's say, by five sub-clan, we will take five uh, also clan elders for those sub-clan and then it becomes a joint decision. So uh, change is always, I mean, in, when you in, in, uh, uh, introduce, uh, you brought the level you know, uh, of inclusivity, these are the things that happen on the grounds because people are used to make their own decision, now they have to consult. So that was the first, uh, um, you know, you know uh, allowing other clan members to also make a decision on that seat. Uh, so that was the first one. Now, secondly, in 2016, uh, we, may, we came up with 51, um, you know, delegates that will then uh, elect the seat. So again, you brought, you bring uh, the, cons you know, you, a small constituency. And we made a uh, regulation in which we were saying on, from those 51, we want this amount of youth this uh, number of women, clan elders. So we try to make the, uh, the delegates as, as broad as possible. And that was, again, another example of, uh, of uh, broadening and making the process inclusive. Then in 2012, uh, election was only happening in the, the capital city of, uh, in, of Somalia, which is Mogadishu. Now, uh, in 2016, we had five member states. We had um, uh, Garroway, uh, Puntland is the, f the federal member state, and the, the, the city is Garroway, Kismayo, Beidoa. Uh, we had Adado and, uh, and, and Kismayo as well, um, and Johar. So five uh, cities plus the capital six. So again, we brought the election to, to the rest of the country. So uh, that also, uh, the result of this in, uh, broadening the inclusivity was that in 2012, we, have t we had 14% female MPs, and 2016, we came all the way to 26, uh, combining, and then we introduced the upper house that we didn't have before. So I think, um, this has been a major leap uh, for women in Somalia uh, and for moving uh, towards a more inclusive society. Uh, so this will also allow you, uh, yeah, we had more young generation I and mean, young MPs coming on board. So I think um, we need to build on that, but I think we had a good example. In 2020, uh, we are aiming to have one person, one vote. So there is an opportunity for us to build on and keep and, um, you know, the gains we have made in terms of women representation. Um, my ministry is eager to support this. And in particular, we have an ambition to organize a national conference in Somalia that will, that can allow different uh, Somali women to develop their share um, position on this roadmap. Uh, if I can give another example on uh, human actually, rights. Actually, why, why don't you hold on that, and okay. we'll come back to you. Mm -hmm. um, but that was a terrific example of the power of inclusion, yes. and we, all, we will all be looking for 2020. Yes, um, <laughs> me too. <laughs> we also heard from Jago and Alexander, and thank you for a terrific overview, that one of the other key recommendations was focus on grievances. So, Oscar, I want to go to you, and mm -hmm. what, are, what are some practical ways that the UN is thinking about how to address grievances as a part of these strategies going forward. Thank you, so first of all, Nancy, and, and to everybody here, uh, uh, thank you for this very welcoming and this opportunity actually to come back, this time with Frank, and uh, to be able to actually say that we are resolving our grievances, uh, land standing <laughs> grievances between that was not a set -up organizations, and, and it does speak, I think, uh, yeah. fundamentally. Yeah. 
uh, to the importance of addressing issues in a, if you will, in a collaborative manner, mm -hmm. this new way of partnering, I think, is quite crucial to this whole agenda of, of prevention and getting the thinking and the targeting and focusing on the, on the actors, on institutions and structural factors, it is what has been missing. Our institutions, unfortunately, have been siloed in the approach and the way we undertake our responses. Certainly within the UN, this is one of the top priorities of our Secretary General, is to break the silos and to have much more collaborative efforts between humanitarian actors, human rights actors, development, and peace and security actors. And it's this notion of addressing the grievances as very well uh, you know, spelled out in the report. I mean, the issue of grievances is not new, right? I mean, there's, there's been a lot of studies about grievances. The issue is how do we deal with them? At what point and in what manner? And I think this is quite important because the report actually makes a very compelling case, provides a lot of data, a lot of empirical evidence um, that for prevention, to work. I mean, we do need to focus on these grievances as they are expressed both in geographical spaces, as they are uh, addressing specific communities, uh, specific identities. And ethnicity here many times is one of the many important factors to be addressing, as we see in many parts of the conflicts um, that we are addressing. So the issue, again, is that grievances don't just happen overnight. This is not a 24-hour thing. Uh, grievances take a long, long time. And I think the chart that you saw, you know, the, the, is actually a chart that usually spans between 10 and 20 years. And so the issue is what do we do well ahead? Well ahead that these grievances become uh, mobilized, that we have a narrative that starts building, either uh, because of the actual uh, facts and, and statements or because of perceptions, the perception issues of access to power, issues of how security is provided, issues to justice, issues of governance, natural resources. I mean, all those examples are important categories around which we need to actually redirect and prioritize resources because the way that resources are under-prioritized on prevention, the way we have such a hard time prioritizing prevention, and doing prevention in this new integrated manner where mediation efforts, preventive diplomacy, um, the, the political solutions that many times are at the heart of, uh, if you will, de-escalating conflicts needs to come, uh, needs to be supported primarily by development actors. Many of the key drivers, the root causes of conflict are in the realm of uh, social and economic, um, if you will, factors. Uh, to which, of course, all those other that were in that circle, climate change, migration, et cetera, are sort of, um, you know, propellers. Uh, concrete examples, just let me tell you, because in the case of Tajikistan uh, or Kyrgyzstan, um, a lot of what we're doing has a lot to do with working with local authorities. It's creating the capacities of local authorities to actually create that space for inclusive dialogue, for participation in the design and implementations of programs that are very much addressed to improving the way social services are equally distributed among different ethnic groups. This is, you know, it sounds easier than, 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 than fact to do, but it comes with the prioritization of the resources. How you get the voices of women, of young people, how you address issues of exclusion on political um, security and justice mechanisms. And the reason this is important is that you see that if you do local surveys, you instantly see this notion of trust and confidence between citizens and uh, you know, governments improve quite dramatically in a space of just two times, uh, sorry, two years, and with minor investments, I would say in the order of 10 to $12 million. We've seen in some of the worst affected areas of the conflict that happened in Kyrgyzstan, actually diffuse the type of tensions and start addressing issues of inclusivity through the curricula in schools, with the participation, the economic participation, and again, this, this notion of, um, of, a, of, a, of a comprehensive approach to the type of solutions um, that we're trying to do. And you know, some of these are really good ideas that are not necessarily new. They haven't been done in such a cogent way, evidence-based way, um, with I think the, particularly the really excellent case studies. But what's really, I think, 
important is also the business case because these good ideas are often not funded for reasons. You know, it's, we, we are very reactive. And so, Franck, tell us, tell us a bit more about the business case. How do, how do we use this report to help really make the case for why it's more cost effective to do it this way, upstream, not just be reactive? Thank you, thank you, Nancy, and uh, very happy actually to, to be here uh, with colleagues, with our client, who is really our raison d'être. So I'm very happy to be next to minister, our partners. And it's true that uh, this report is, is quite important. I mean, for me, I summarize it by saying it's uh, acting early, acting jointly, but also staying engaged, which is super important, by focusing on the drivers of fragility and risk of violence. That's the report. So it's just a question of, oh, so what does it change? First, I'm very happy that uh, the case, business case, or economic case for prevention, if it was ever needed to be done, is made. When you look at the report, the review of the, the 19, 15 countries, showing that clearly uh, the case for prevention is that, well, on average, violent conflicts uh, cost $13 trillion, which is about 13% of the world GDP, but that uh, the net savings from prevention average between five to $70 billion per year. For me, the most important Five reasons. Five to seventy billion. That's what you have seen. So I think the business case is there. We we forget one element, which is even more important, is that it it, it, it saves lives. <laughs> That's for me the, the, the most important point. Uh, so it's not a question too much about justifying why prevention is so important. Uh, I think it's more about how do you do it, and you have some good cases, and that's why the study is actually looking at some of the uh, good case and success, and trying to draw some conclusions. For the World Bank. Uh, clearly, we are really changing the way we see the partnership with many uh, actors. In fact, today, as you know, we're in the middle of the Fragility Forum, uh, having more than 1,000 participants, 47 sessions to discuss fragility, which is really the issue of our time. Now, three-fourths of the sessions are not organized by the bank. They're organized by academics, university, by yourself, uh, by uh, UN, by other private sectors, because for us, it's very important to realize that to get to our objective of eradication of poverty, you need to focus on fragile states, you need to focus, focus on fragility. Business as usual is very clear. By 2030, between 43 and 60% of the poor will be in fragile states. So it's not anymore the debate about 20 years ago, should we focus on fragile states, you have issue of governance. I'm so happy that that's over. The whole point is, fine, how do you do it? This report is so important by saying, listen, it's not a qu question there, there are four remarks that are important, if I may. First one is, you need to get uh, early on, have a better assessment of the risk. It's not a story of having a crisis and humanitarian actors stepping in, and then later on having development actors. So that's why we are more and more engaged in the middle of the crisis, but also before. Uh, and I can give a number of, of, of examples. For instance, the joint, so I say, okay, what does that mean? Well, let's give three or four concrete cases. We are developing with the UN and the EU under the leadership of the government in many countries what we call uh, risk, uh, the or recovery peace building assessment. Recovery peace building assessment. Well, fine, you could say it's another assessment from Washington, New York, and so on, and Brussels, but it's actually very important. If you look at what happened in Mali, in CR, those type of assessment under the leadership of the government, which is very important, allows not only to prioritize the type of investment, but also help the government to engage with those parties that have been excluded in the process, so that we can actually get from those uh, plan a real program of the government in terms of addressing the grievances. So I think having the type of analytics is very important and doing it jointly. Secondly, in terms of financing, you could say, how do you provide the incentive? The key point is how to avoid the CNN events. Everybody loves to step in when there is already a picture on TV and when you see that there is already a crisis. How can you make sure that you put the financing two years in advance? And what we are doing at the bank for the first time, we have a specific window for the poorest countries that is dedicated to prevention. So basically we're telling, we're starting with four countries, Nepal, Niger, Tajikistan, uh, and uh, Guinea. And we are basically uh, providing up to one third of the national IDAR resource to those countries, but with one caveat. It has to address the specific root cause of fragility could be like in Niger, we're looking at mining sector, we're looking at all the pastoralist issue, the management of land, which is very critical. And if those countries decide to really tackle those issues, we are then providing additional resource. This is a concrete example under the IDA uh, resource window uh, that we do with financing. So 
changing the way we do analytics, we do assessment. We are also doing risk resilient assessment. You are saying, okay, it's another assessment from the World Bank. Not at all. We are doing it jointly with the UN, such as in CR, in Guinea-Bissau. And that helps us to design the operation so that we can focus not business as usual, but specifically on those grievances. So new assessment in any fragile states, we have to carry out those risk resilient assessments that inform the type of operation so that we don't put all on fire, but we are specifically addressing the root cause of fragility. Secondly, financing, where there is a clear incentive to borrow or to receive grants for preventions. And the last point is actually to engage in, with the peace building actors, with humanitarian actors. If you are looking, for instance, I was in Kinshasa last week. Uh, I mean, I spent a lot of time with our UN colleagues. We are looking at having a new program in Kasai, one of the poorest regions, lagging regions, uh, to ensure that we can work at the time of the famine with both humanitarian actors and uh, security actors. Is that something new? Yeah. To 10, 20 years ago, it would have been, well, it's a crisis. We'll see at the end of the crisis how development actors can come into place. Today, we're looking about how can we make sure that the system of delivery, the cash transfer, the focus on services are going to provide it. Otherwise, there is a risk of escalating of violences. So I think, yes, I, my main message is to say we have a business case for prevention. But more importantly, we are really operationalizing it in full partnership, not only with the UN, but actually with also many other actors. And the last point, obviously, is the importance of the leadership of the government. At the end of the day, they are the one who have uh, to take responsibility for actions and be willing. We are just there to provide a framework, to provide the incentive that it's true, we're not necessarily in place a and, few years And that ago. financing is only available to those countries whose leadership commit to this kind of framework? So uh, we just started, the four countries that I mentioned for the have prevention, this is, just, this is just the countries that have already uh, I mean, it's followed a long analysis of the different risks, but clearly that are in the, the risk of uh, potentially getting into a, level, a higher level of, of violences. Mm -hmm. And obviously you need to have commitments from the countries uh, while benefiting from the funding. But it's not only about this window. They are, what is very important for me, uh, Senior Director of the Fragility Group, is that the bank is going to double the resource from $7 billion to $14 billion. $14 billion. This has never happened over the next three years in fragile states. Right. It's, and it's, it's and groundbreaking. But, but financing is not all. The whole point is that if it's financing, you can do, you know, you can do not necessarily the optimal way. It's actually making sure that those programs are designed in a way that they address the grievances. And that's, that's the most important point. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. I, I want to uh, move to you, Kate, because um, as, as we know, USAID established, what, 15 years ago or so? The, the Office for Conflict Management and Mitigation, which was an early effort to try to infuse some of these concepts into the development activities. Um, how, do you, how do you see that effort going forward with this kind of you know, wind in the sails, this kind of uh, uptake from major institutions like the World Bank and the UN, and what do you see as the major barriers that USAID has thus far encountered in really moving that through the development efforts. Thank you, Nancy, for the question, and thank you for the invitation to be here alongside um, the partners. Um, as you noted, we have undertaken, and I, our presenters noted it as well, many of these concepts and ideas are not new. Uh, many of our institutions have been grappling with these issues for a long time. And you say it specifically, we established the Fragile States Policy in 2005 making a very concerted effort to look at the targeted interventions to mitigate and manage conflict specifically. Um, a lot of these ideas we've all been working on, um, and, and some, I think, with some success over the years. Right? I think um, the idea of inclusion has been infused into the work that we do. A lot of what we do on the conflict prevention side aligns very well with good development practice, and those are the areas, I think, that have gained the most traction in terms of working closely with local partners, having a field focus, um, the inclusion angle, et cetera. I think some of the challenges and what these efforts now may help us break through to the next step, I think in terms of uh, working jointly, um, as noted, you know, you talk about we've, there's been a lot of early warning efforts, but does early warning actually lead to early action? I would say in USAID's case, from a development perspective, in some cases it does at the activity level. We have great examples in terms of you know, doing conflict analysis in places like Kenya and then integrating programs to mitigate violence for elections, et cetera. But does that working at the development level, acting early, translate to working jointly and acting early? 
I think that's one of the biggest challenges that hopefully this report and all the actors in the room can help move forward. Um, because as we all know, development actors as big as we are, we're just one of the many actors in the room, the development side, the diplomacy side, security, interagency, overlay that against the international community. And the ecosystem is bigger and bigger. It's not just donors, it's the non-state actors, the business sector, et cetera, and the host country government. So how do you get all those actors? I think what we often find in cases of um, trying to act early is that people have the time and the luxury to be thinking and acting early are not the ones with the money. And when you're in the middle of a crisis, <laughs> that's when you have the money and nobody actually has the time to be thinking thoughtfully about these things. So I think that's one of the challenges hopefully this um, brings forward. The other one I would note in terms of, I think um, sustainability is the other challenge. I think as a development agency and, and you know what CMM, Conflict Mitigation Office and others have been able to do is to help link the conflict mitigation angle to the longer term development um, trajectory. And we have with our administrator in place now, the big focus for us is really, you've heard him talk about the need to end, the, the, the purpose of development is to end the need for foreign assistance itself, right? So how do you work that in over the long term? Um, and I think trying to work in, you know, looking at how you do that within a conflict setting and realizing that the ability to actually affect and break this cycle is key to that in the long term. And when we talk about sustainment is the other part that um, came up in the presentation. I think we've done a good job with the targeting and the inclusion as far as the principles go. The sustainment of resources over the entire cycle I think has been a challenge for us. Big challenge. So I think we've been able, we've been successful in getting some attention to the issue, getting resources in early, but trying to get all the actors involved and then sustaining not just early. I would say in some ways it's much, it's even harder for us you know, it's hard to get money and attention early. You get some on the development level. In the middle of a crisis, you have a lot of attention, you have a lot of resources. But then a year out, two years out, five years out, 10 years out, all of everyone in the room knows what the, the pattern looks like for recurrence, for conflict, and how long it takes to actually be out of that zone. But in terms of trying to get resources to a conflict five years, that was on the front pages of the newspaper five years ago, I think that's been um, a big Yeah, we're, we're, I just got back from Iraq, and yeah. we're at exactly that place right now where the military campaign was deemed successful, and there's this cr crucial need for sustained engagement where I think there's a danger that there'll be a drop off. It, it, we're gonna see that pattern. And if I could just one short point and a plug in terms of what um, I think we're doing well and I would really encourage in terms of move, moving forward is not just the practice and changing the culture but enshrining it in policy. Um, I think having our new national security strategy now recognizing the need for conflict prevention is a step towards that. But I think really enshrining it is key. So the last four national security strategies have enshrined it. Yeah. And so <laughs> it's how do you move evidence and policy to action? Um, we're going to open it up for questions. Back, there are mics yeah. on either uh, aisles here and I'm going to uh, I wish that we could keep going with these great panelists, but I do, I, I know there are a lot of people in the room with lots of expertise. So if you want to go to the mic, Michael, it's right behind you, or here, it's going to come to you. And Michael, if you want to say your name for people. Michael Lund, uh, MSI. Um, thanks again for this really impressive uh, joint effort to put conflict prevention uh, back on the international agenda. Um, I think that the report, and everybody should read it in depth. I've read it three times. Uh, and there's a lot of nuggets of uh, empirical wisdom uh, in it, so it's well worth uh, study. Um, I especially like the emphasis, the bringing out of the research on elite political settlements, uh, the importance of narratives and perceptions, um, the ambivalent effects of uh, political openness and economic growth, that they're a double-edged sword. Um, but my question follows up on Nancy's uh, final point in a way. Uh, specifically, how do we activate all these good ideas and all these actors and all this evidence and all these prescriptions in particular places at particular times that, that, need, that need the attention? Who takes the primary responsibility for catalyzing, for activating a process of strategy development 
in particular places where uh, the risk factors are emerging. Uh, I mean, one result of this event and your subsequent uh, rollout events around the world, apparently, would be that uh, various organizations, NGOs, uh, and, and new groups that are, uh, are, are being tapped by the report, corporations, for example, um, go back to their desks and figure out how they can tweak their existing programs and projects in this sector or that country. Uh, and in that sense, there probably will be some improvement overall in conflict prevention. But that doesn't capture or, or address what have been typical situations where major catastrophic conflicts have emerged, such as in Syria, that have had reverberating effects um, in particular places at particular times. So how do you kickstart a process of convening meetings across not only individual organizations, but uh, among organizations? Now, let me just make one uh, example, one example, Ethiopia. Sure. Um, uh, right now, it, it's exhibiting a lot of the crisis risk factors, uh, some violence. Uh, it's got a lot of things going for it, but some threats on the horizon and presently. Um, who should take the responsibility for addressing a situation like that that fits exactly your analysis? Thanks. Great. Thank you, Michael. That's a great example of Ethiopia. and. Um, uh, Madam Minister, I, I'm going to look to you to start us off and then welcome responses from the panel. But who, you know, the report talks a lot about the importance of leadership, local leadership, and your example was a very compelling and powerful example. Who, who should, who, in the example of Ethiopia, where does the, where does, where does the action begin? Who catalyzes bringing people together to implement these kinds of recommendations? Um, I've, if I can um, just um, use um, an example in, in Somalia, for instance, which is, um, I think, then can answer to that question. Um, when a major crisis happens, yeah, we had in October the, the bombing of, uh, um, of the Zobe area, which is the city of Mogadishu. It's, it's with a lot of people, over 300 people lost their lives. Um, one of the things that uh, we were really struggling was how do you get a coordinated support from the different stakeholders. And the, the Prime Minister has uh, established a um, group of, of ministers from different, uh, the internal security, women and human rights, health, to, uh, to come together and address the issue and coordinate. But it was a challenge uh, at the country level to have all the stakeholders to coming together and, and, and respond to our needs. So what these reports, I think, uh, highlights is the importance of you know, not working in silos and in a coordinated manner, because at the end of the day, uh, countries that are experiencing fragility, what they need is response to the need in a collaborative manner. The, as, from, from, from our end, you know, this, this report really uh, help, I think, the, the different international, uh, whether it's World Bank, international NGOs, uh, as the gentleman said, it, for them to really come together and, 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 and help because these reports help us now to, to come together and, and continue the dialogue of how to do it, how we can put in mechanism and uh, the leadership of, uh, of uh, the different governments then can use that platform and then uh, engage and, and respond. But at the end of the day, f f you know, coming from the reality on the ground, what we need is a, is a coordinated support for, for this government when, uh, you know, whether it's, um, you know, uh, responding to a, a, a case like what happened in October mm -hmm. in Somalia or when uh, conflicts are arising. So it's also important that at the country level, 
we have expertise in this with the, uh, the, with the UN or World Bank at the country level to really help uh, respond and continue the dialogue because it's, it's sometimes what happens is that there is this disconnect from, um, from what happens on the ground and at the Washington level. So I think uh, Never we, need to, we need to really work how to, to, to really make uh, use of this report, but at the implementation level. Others want to come in on that? Does this change how we do planning, both within the specific institutions or within and among institutions? Awesome. Just, just very quickly, I mean, an excellent question, Michael, and I, I think it's very pertinent in terms of, uh, you know, the state of affairs of the world today and the paralysis that we do see in terms of how do we bring the different institutions to collaborate and work across the different dimensions of, of, of conflict, pre prevention of violent conflict. So first and foremost, I think it, it is a crucial, uh, I think, uh, thing to state here that the report actually makes a very important case about how important the issue of the, the, the role and responsibility of the state as the first actor who is responsible for prevention of violent conflict. And here the notion of national ownership and inclusivity is fundamental here. I mean, there's, um, and I say this because Clearly, prevention in some circles or can be construed also to be uh, foreseen as intervention. And here, I think it's extremely important that what this report actually points to, that prevention is fundamentally a sovereignty-enhancing mechanism. We are talking about building, rebuilding institutions that reflect a social contract, that build social cohesion, that bring trust and confidence. That, that perform and, and support development practices of an inclusionary nature, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, the report gives a lot of cases to this extent. But something that I think is hugely important is this notion of how we interlink uh, preventive diplomacy efforts. And here, speaking on behalf of the UN, I mean, the important role that the Secretary General's good offices can have for mediation efforts that uh, the Department of Political Affairs can undertake to get to the politics of the resolution of the conflict. Because again, there's a lot of, uh, of, 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 of movement in that direction that needs to happen. But again, because of the changing nature of conflict and the big challenge, the UN is not alone here. And we do need, and the UN needs to work across this notion of partnerships. Partnerships, I mean, certainly in the case of Africa, the Secretary General has made uh, the partnership with the African Union a, a, a sort of a cardinal strategic partnership of sorts. Uh, and the sub-regional organizations, uh, ECOWAS, SADC, et cetera, how we jointly perform mediation efforts jointly, I, extremely important. But then the big gap here is this distance between mediation efforts and then the financing of many of the proposed solutions or opportunity entry points, if you will. And here, this, I think, challenges both the bank and the UN uh, in how to be much more flexible, much more responsive, mm -hmm. and how to work with new partners. And here civil society has been mentioned. I think the last time we were here, we were talking to this notion about involving not just government actors, but civil society actors, women and youth in particular, and targeting this in marginal areas. I mean, I think a lot of the conflicts that we see today, and some of the countries mentioned here, uh, the origin of these conflicts usually come from the periphery towards the center here. We, we have uh, the ungovernability of big spaces in national territories that is suddenly the big challenge across the Sahel and in many regions of the world. So here, um, this interlinkage between diplomatic efforts, the way security is being undertaken and provide this issue of, of citizen security, access to justice, and the linkage with human rights, I think, are, are extremely important factors. I'm going to see. We, we're, we're unfortunately running tight on time, so I'll take a couple of questions, and then we may have to roll into a wrap-up. But um, there's a question right there. And uh, go ahead. Good morning. Um, my name is James Turpin. I work at the Office of the High Commission of Human Rights in, in New York. Um, and I just wanted to pick up on the last point that, that Oscar just made about the link with human rights. Um, this is a fantastic study, very detailed study of, of the links uh, between development and conflict. Um, it, it's being published the year that the UN is celebrating 
the 70th anniversary of the Universal Declaration, which the SG actually has called one of our best prevention tools. And if you look at the preamble of that document, it's very clearly framed as a conflict prevention tool. It also comes on the 20th, I think, anniversary of the adoption by the UN system of rights-based development as an approach to development. Um, so in some ways it's a bit perplexing that a report which actually uses a lot of the rights analysis, if you like, um, of, of inclusion, of addressing grievance, of participation, of uh, inequalities and so on, um, keeps human rights at some arm's length. It's careful about human rights. And I just wanted to, to get a sense of the panel's sense of how human rights actually contributes, and specifically the, the normative framework, the legal framework, which I think can help um, open okay, space for prevention. Okay, got it. Pass the microphone behind you to the woman in the green shirt, and then we'll go over here. Over here next. Thank you very much. I'm Isabella Todd from Corelli in the Netherlands. But I'm going to uh, ask everybody to be very short. short. Very short. Yeah. I would like to, uh, well, thank you for the, uh, I mean, on a constate, that you, there is need for uh, agile and flexible, consolidated financing solutions. And I would like to ask the esteemed panelists, how do you see, how do you strike the balance between that, the need for that, and the need for institutions and bilateral donors to be accountable to their own backyard in terms of parliaments and all that? Because there, I feel a bit of tension in that. Good question, thank you. Okay, over here. Um, thanks for the great report. Uh, my question is primarily to the UN and World Bank members of the panel. Uh, you mentioned demographics and you meant and with this emphasis on prevention wouldn't if you take more of a 20-year time frame wouldn't helping countries provide reproductive health services and working on reducing the rate of population growth especially in some sub-saharan african countries with very high uh, population growth rates wouldn't that make all of the drivers of conflict easier to manage 20 years out you know youth aspirations, youth goals, migration, climate change, all these things. Okay, if you can hold those in your head, I'm gonna take one more, and then that'll, and uh, down, down here in front. No, no, right here with the, yeah, Matt, gentleman with the tie. Hi, uh, my name's uh, Julian Egan, I'm from International Alert. Um, I'm wondering, what do you do as international actors when the state is fundamentally a part of the problem, uh, when it's a key driver of conflict? Yes, that's the heartbeat. Okay, I want to start. <laughs> I want to start with uh, Madam Minister because earlier you started to give an example of human rights, and it's so. If you could start us with this question of how do you see the human rights as woven through this, and we'll ask. Uh, additional responses, but and yes. if you want to challenge yes. any of these other or, or address any of the other questions as well, please do so. Um, I think um, the gentleman has asked how um, human rights could be, if I understood you correctly, um, conflict prevention, right? Um, an example, and then that links to um, you know have more inclusivity in the process. So uh, one example is that um, my ministry is, has the mandate of uh, human rights development in Somalia. Uh, recently, we um, led the development of the Independent Human Rights Commission in Somalia, which is uh, uh, constitutionally mandated. And uh, we, we uh, went through an inclusive process in which uh, Unlike other commission, independent commission that happened in, in Somalia, uh, this specific law that uh, was passed, um, it gave a specific direction on how this process should be. And, you know, it took power from the ministry actually to uh, come up with a panel. Rather, we, uh, we came up with 19 people who came from the federal member states so this was the first time that we had actually the federal member state uh, sending their representative uh, to the, in this panel and the region of Benadra as well. So 19 people and the law indicated specifically that each member state had to send two people and one 
uh, was to be a woman. So 19 people in that panel, we had 10 women. And that was the first time it was close to 50%. Then this 19 um, technical selection panel went through an inclusive process and we had people applying online, giving also an opportunity to the diaspora, Somali diaspora to actually apply uh, online um, and send their um, CVs and all of that. The, we received over 600 uh, requests for nine uh, positions. Uh, the panel went through, um, uh, we had also uh, observed international observers. Uh, we had the UN, uh, the Human Rights mm -hmm. and um, Pro uh, Protection Group in, in Somalia. After that, uh, we came up with nine commissioners. Uh, we, have also, we had also EU observing the process. We had nine commissioners. And out of that nine, we, for the first time, four were women and one with person with disability. So sometimes processes like that can also allow, uh, you know, uh, people who were feeling uh, excluded to be part of the process. But you all embraced the idea of human rights. Yes. That was, in your mind, a driver of moving with peace. Absolutely. Moving towards peace. Yes. Okay. And this, we use this process actually to. Uh, and it was a my big milestone for Somalia, not only first to establish the independent human rights, but the process in which we went through and the outcome which is uh, for the first time to have four commissioners who are women uh, mm -hmm. and a person with disability so, for the first time. So strong on inclusivity. Absolutely. Yeah. Kate, how, how, how do you see this, this balance, accountability to capitals, I mean, this is one yeah. of the core drivers. This is a, a big issue, I think, for, for all of us uh, to deal with. And I think part of what's so helpful with the report is key to this, and it's building the evidence base. Right? You cannot argue for more resources until you have that evidence base. And you cannot, can, you cannot be accountable to your own government and Congress unless you demonstrate the effectiveness of what you do. So I think that's critical um, to, to that period. Um, if I could just briefly uh, touch on the human rights point, I, I won't touch on whether, why, how it's treated in the report. We'll let these guys do that. Yeah. <laughs> in terms of, um, it, I think human rights is a critical issue in terms of the government's ability to protect human rights leads uh, directly to it's, how it's viewed as whether it's legitimate or illegitimate. And the other aspect for it for us is we look at, as we talk about early warning, as we look at early warning signs, if you look at human rights abuses, you can see directly the path from individual rights abuses that escalates, 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 gets to a, a situation of conflict. So I think uh, central to that. And that's and linked, uh, what you, the, the way you just laid it out, it's very linked to the question about what do you do when the state, state. is the problem. That's and the report actually does an interesting job of, of identifying the role for nonviolent civil movements mm -hmm. You know, so that you truly have bottom-up change driving uh, a, a more peaceful way forward as a means of pushing for inclusion. Um, are there other ways that the report looks at how to deal with the, the issue of not having a state partner? Um, and then the demographics and the whole link to human rights. And I'm going to say, take it away, mm -hmm. Frank and Oscar, to close us out. Um, as we're right at the end of time here, so. But, but just, just on the human rights, because I know this is always a, a difficult uh, discussion. Uh, you know, we, we talk about the discussions that happen in New York, in Geneva, and in Washington, since because we're in Washington, let me just say, because we're in Washington. Um, I think it's important that the assessment methodologies that we're using have elements that ascertain how much, um, you know, the, 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 the civil, political, economic, social, and cultural rights are being manifest uh, in a given circumstance as we are um, assessing precisely this, this notion of grievances, how they play out on the different, on the different uh, um, scales, if you will, of, 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 of response, so the strength of institutions, the voice and participation of civil society, the capacities 
of governments to actually undertake a lot of their uh, national obligations. And no, this is all part of assessing the capacities of the counterparts in terms of how the United Nations actually performs and designs its own programs, how we deploy expertise, how we mobilize uh, resources to address the gaps that could be uh, manifest as a result of these, uh, of these assessment. The importance about the jointness of the assessment is that we bring the different comparative and collaborative advantages of each one of the institutions. And I, I would you know, dare say the very strong uh, and keen analysis on economic uh, factors, social factors coming from the World Bank, complemented with the political dynamics assessments, the security assessments. I mean, interestingly, that on security, increasingly we are doing public expenditure reviews jointly. Mm -hmm. And the recent case in the Gambia actually involving other partners, uh, the regional uh, organizations, the bank, the European Union, the UN, in doing these assessments jointly because the way security is handled and performed and how it's reformed has a huge bearing in terms of how this is perceived and, and how it impacts. And, and two member state institutions, which is in, an important feature. Exactly, exactly. So, and, and in terms of, because I know we're, we're just hitting the 1030 mark here, just to stress that how uh, Frank actually started his, his whole statement about the importance of this report is almost just to echo uh, in my own concluding remarks, that this is now about translating a lot of the empirical, the business case has been made. I think. A lot of the capital, somebody was asking about the parliament. I mean, we have been asked repeatedly over and over and over, what is the business case? Mm -hmm. What is proof the counterfactual? What is the cost benefit analysis? So for once, we have a report that needs to be read and interpreted because yeah. if we keep asking for more evidence, it's a good excuse and this is the problem. Uh, the excuse is a little bit what we have been not addressing. The excuse not to act early when the cost of addressing the grievances is much, much lower. The cost of managing the crisis in terms of humanitarian response, in terms of political security responses of peacekeeping operations, in terms of refugee uh, insertion cost in some uh, particular parts of the world, over the past 10 years alone, alone cost over $240 billion. This is all resources that are not going to development, that are not going to inclusive, peaceful uh, societies. These are all resources that are not delivering more health, education, and inclusivity. These are resources that are being used to manage a crisis, not to resolve the crisis. So this is about prioritizing prevention, is about using our instruments of analysis, of joint analysis, of joint uh, programming, and leveraging. I think here, extremely important. I mean, mm -hmm. Frank just mentioned, $40 billion of IDA 18 resources going to fragile states requires a comparative response from the part of the UN system to help build the capacities of many governments to absorb and deliver this aid and to complement it with the other critical aspects, which is good governance, which is respect of human rights, which is a security and justice system that responds, that we learn from these studies to know what type of policies we should not be pushing for and what type of counter uh, you know, and the evidence is coming from this report. So for us, the imperative word to conclude here is operationalizing this report across, within the UN, across, you know, the humanitarian, human rights, peace and security, and development actors. Thank, Thank you, you Asuka. Uh, quick, really short, because we're over time. Uh, I just wanted to quickly say that the women and youth, the report says that women and youth uh, inclusion is a conflict prevention. So I, uh, we welcome, uh, you know, uh, this, my government strongly welcome the message uh, that investing in inclusivity and, and making women and youth uh, participation, um, it's a conflict prevention. It's, however, it's our hope that this also will translate into development partners to apply the same level of consistent focus and support to this issue as they do with other issues. So it's very important what the, uh, the report says to really actually uh, make Thank it you. happen. Great, great. And you have a powerful example of what's going on in Somalia. Frank. Thank you. No, just to, to build on what Oscar mentioned, I think what uh, beyond making the case for prevention, I hope we will never hear any longer about justifying why we need to focus on, on prevention. 
I think this report also is looking at the way we do business differently, the type of program, development assistance. We talk about inclusive approach, we talk about lagging regions, we talk about youth expectation, we talk about, now is it something new? Well, we had the Arab Spring a few years ago, and we realized, I mean, at least on the World Bank side as well, that it was a completely different way that we need to think about support to the Middle East and North Africa regions. You have actually the World Bank strategy in MENA, which is contributing to peace and stability, which is so therefore recognizing the importance for development actors to work with peace building actors and to support government towards addressing those grievances and to build a social contract. I think we have moved away uh, from uh, uh, an institutions and different institutions operating in silo, not necessarily focusing on those grievances, uh, not necessarily having a local approach, but also we have also moved away from having, uh, in terms of having new instruments, financing. What do I mean? We mentioned just a few minutes ago the fact that we have new dedicating window to support fragile states that are actually adding financing for countries that are focusing on prevention. That's actually a clear example about how we, we move the needle in terms of financing. We talked about the analytics, the fact that with the UN, with the EU, and under the leadership of government, more and more systematically, Mali, Ukraine, CAR, uh, we are conducting those joint recovery peace building assessment. It's very important because it helps actually to put all the stakeholders under the table. Now, who takes the leadership? It's the government. But sometimes the government obviously uh, needs some support, neutral partners, to build all the parts of, of the conflicts and different groups under the table. And so do you do something differently if there's no uptake by local leadership? Well, I think what is, what is important for us, I mean, on the World Bank side, we're working with all uh, the countries uh, that are partners uh, with the World Bank. That's very important. At the end of the day, you heard Oscar saying it rightly. It's not a prevention, it's not interference. You know, the prevention is to ensure that you are going to strengthen the social contract and you are going to make sure that all the voice are being heard, whether it's about women, whether it's about youth, and with, whether it's all about all the different parties. So I think this glue is very important, and the whole point is to ensure that those grievances are being, are being met. My very, very last point on, on, on this one, so my point is to say you cannot bypass, and uh, you need to work with partners and making sure that you have the evidence, that you have the assessment, and that you provide the incentive. That's new, providing the incentive. So what I'm saying, concrete example, we have worked with Jordan and Lebanon. Jordan and Lebanon are hosting the highest number of refugees per capita, by the way. 90%, uh, 9-0 of refugees in Jordan and Lebanon following the conflict in Syria are not in camps. They are living in Jordan and Lebanon. What we have set up is actually recognizing the public good by opening their borders that Jordan and Lebanon were providing. We provided for the first time ever concessional financing to middle-income countries. And not only for the World Bank, for all the other MDBs working in Jordan and Lebanon. Again, that's a way that you can incentivize and recognize that countries are contributing to stability and there is no more spillover. So I think it's very important through our instruments, assessment, tool, financing, that under the leadership of those governments, we actually provide them the support needed to focus on prevention, early warning, but also contributing to a uh, pathway for, for peace. At the bank, honestly, this is critical. Number one priority is uh, we're looking at fragility, as I mentioned, not only in terms of doubling the financing, which is important, but the, the way of doing business differently and partnering with institutions with which we were not necessarily partnering, or with which we were partnering, but in a sequence manner. Today, when there is a peace building effort during negotiation in a country, you're going to see the World Bank through development and also all the development actors providing the type of programs dealing with land management, dealing with mining, which are critical as part of the negotiation. So who's doing the negotiation? That's government with the key counterparts, with the support of the UN peace building. However, development actors have a key role to play at this stage. And that I think is, that's really what the, what the report is, is about. Many thanks again for, for, we are so happy to be at the Institute uh, for Peace. I think it's fantastic to be here for the launching of this report. And uh, we are going to focus big time on the operationalization. I think that was my main, uh, main message. And the partnership with the UN, I can tell you, has never been as strong as it is, uh, as it is today. So many thanks. Those are, those are terrific, solid messages. Um, please join me in thanking a terrific panel. Minister Yassin, good luck in Somalia. Thank you to Frank and Oscar to the World Bank and to the UN. Kate, thank you for joining us. Great to have you in Dacha. <laughs> thank you, everybody. And obviously, a conversation uh, that we will no doubt all continue. But this has been a terrific, 
a terrific report to move us forward.